that's very loud. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Cambridge Union. We have a nice soundtrack for this evening, which is lovely. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. We're very... Yep. Katie's here. And please, you know, ask questions. Be, you know, ask anything you like. Uh, but if you can, give her a round of applause. Katie. <laughs> if you can. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, shall I crack on from up here? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you uh, very much for coming this evening. I really appreciate it. I apologise for the soundtrack that we have in the background. Uh, it's for our friends, the protesters. Would you all join me in a round of applause for our protester friends, please, who are doing a valiant job of trying to stop people coming in. I did ask, actually, this evening if I could come in via the protesters in order that we could chat with them, maybe engage them in a conversation, maybe have speech with them. Uh, I was told that I wasn't allowed to do that, which I respect, because, of course, we've paid a lot of money for our security. But I think it is a pity when those people who claim to be the tolerant ones, when those ones who claim to be the kind of liberal ones end up being the ones who don't want someone to be heard. I think it's a curious thing that's happened in this world when those that would want openness, that would want people to be included, becomes the ones that are the oppressors, as I see it. There is mass censorship of speech at the moment, and I think it's a really disappointing thing. And I think what the protesters are doing here is a bit of a pity. I was saying to someone earlier, in many ways, it's people like them that give people like me a voice. They are... Frankenstein, and I am their monster. So the more they do that, the more I do this. So I am a reaction to liberal fascists, as I see it. Anyway, so all rules are off this evening. Uh, you can ask anything you want. You can say anything you want. I am impossible to offend. I have no filter, and I have no secrets, and I have nothing to hide. So the name of the game is to try and embarrass you to the point of not being able to speak, but also to say exactly how you feel. <laughs> Just say the word vagina occasionally, he tends to blush. Anything, um, anything you've ever wanted to type on Twitter, anything on social media where you really want to, uh, uh, that woman, just say it. You know, feel free to say it. There's, there's absolutely nothing that I hold against you and I prefer to hear opinions other than my own so you can help inform me uh, so I have wisdom going forward. Okay, I'll shut up. Oh, hold on. Does anyone know what it is, the chant? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank it's you, unfortunate, Casey. but I wish it was a bit natty, but I don't know what it is. I can't okay. tell. I can't tell. Uh, my first question for you is, have you ever said something and then thought, actually, I don't really think that? I can't think of an example of something that I've said that I don't mean or that I don't... or wish I hadn't said... I pretty much say what I think when yes. I think it. I pretty much say what I think without holding back. And I think then the reaction of some people to, to do, you know, against what I say can be quite fierce. But I can't think of a time where I haven't wanted to have said what I've said. What? I've never really wanted to retract something. Right. What, what do you think the most offensive thing you've ever said is? The most offensive thing? Yeah. I don't really know uh, about the most offensive thing. Certainly, uh, fat people have an issue with my kind of views on fat people. I know people have an uh, issue with my views on migration, for example. People took particular umbrage at the use of the word cockroach in a column that I wrote. I mean, those would be examples of things people have found difficult. And what are your views on overweight people, for example? Uh, so, you know, we are the first generation that will die earlier than any generation before us in recent times since improvements in health. And so I think the problem of obesity needs to be kind of taken on the individual. So if you eat yourself half to death, you need to pay for the consequences of that. I think if you eat your way to needing a new hip, you need to pay for your new hip or your new knee. It always strikes me as strange when people say they're on the wait list forever, for two years for a new knee, but can still afford to go on holiday. I think that's the problem with our NHS is that we make it that we're accountable for people's issues and people have stopped caring about their own health. Would you privatise the NHS? Absolutely, yes I would. I think it's important. A social kind of insurance for health seems much more 
it seems just it seems like a more it's a model that we all understand we understand insurance when it comes to cars looking after your cars we understand that if you don't look after your car properly you're going to end up paying more i don't know why we would have a different approach for the human body we know that if you treat it badly it breaks down i don't know why we would want the taxpayer to pick up the bill for your own disregard for yourself okay i'm interested to know do you consider yourself a feminist I think I am a true version of a feminist. I think I am a big feminist. And I think so many other girls, women, who think they're feminists are actually a massive disappointment. I went to the pussy marches. I went to the pussy marches in, and I got Ofcom for using the word pussy as well, actually. Because um, people say it's on the Ofcom list of words you can't use. Yeah. And my editor said it's the same as saying fuck live on air. And I said, it's not, you know, it's part of the Pussy Marches. But the Pussy Marches were uh, a real disappointment because they were super feminist. Like, they were all there with their hats on the day after the presidential inauguration. I went out to kind of join the march to understand them better, to understand what their point was. Some of them were in the city because they had got tickets to celebrate the inauguration of Hillary Clinton. And then because she didn't get in, they didn't want to waste the tickets, which I thought was genius. And I saw a whole bunch of them, you know, and I'd say to one, why are you here? And she'd say, I'm here because of climate change. Climate change matters. Global warming matters. I'd say to the next one, why are you here? Because black lives matter. I'd say to the next one, why are you here? LGBT rights. LGBT rights. Ask the next one, why are you here? Because my vagina's made of steel. It's like these women were pathetic. They were there because they wanted to be women together fighting a cause, but they had no key aim, no one key aim. They had no idea what they were fighting for, and it's why the pushy, pussy marches will only ever be a sort of rabble of women with pussy kind of ears on their head. So I think other feminists are disappointing. I think things like... Um, where you go to complain about things that have happened to you in the street, everyday sexism, that's just bonkers. That's just standing in a cave listening to your own echo. No one does anything about that stuff. So I think most feminists are genuinely disappointing. You say they have no united aim, but surely their united aim is to have gender equality. Well, I, don't, I'd, I would say, if that was your aim, you'd want to have that. You'd want to be able to be explicit. They seem to be just there because of a whole random bunch of causes. It was very fractious. They aren't unified in anything. And you can't just be somewhere because you want to be equal. As far as I'm concerned, women now have equality. I would argue that most women actually want special treatment, not equal treatment these days. And things that we are on a level playing field already. I see no, I see no inequality. And then someone will quote some facts and stats about pay differentials, which don't exist if you actually look at women taking time out for maternity leave. I think we have equality. In every country or just the Well, UK? I didn't say globally, <laughs> but I think on the whole we have equality, and we certainly have equality in Europe. Okay. Um, you like Trump? I love Trump. Why? I love Trump very much because Trump at least was someone, I mean, you guys would struggle to understand here in the little bubble that is Cambridge. And I get that. Like, I think I really represent kind of people that live, regular people that live in the rest of the UK. I certainly don't think that I speak. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I certainly don't speak for London. Like when I'm in zone one and two, I barely recognize myself or what I'm talking about or anything because I'm nothing like anyone there. But I certainly think for the rest of the UK, I hold views that kind of resonate with a lot of people. Here in the Cambridge bubble, I know I'm a crazy outsider that spouts nonsense. But I think in the rest of the UK, with real people that have regular jobs, they think the same kind of stuff as I think. And the reason that Trump got in, even though all of you would have said he had no chance, even though the BBC said he had no chance, all the polls said he had no chance, I always said he would win. Because if you were there, if you were with the people in America, if you were at his convention, you could feel it that there was this movement of this great big bunch of people who feel like they were never being listened to. And I think that's true, and that was true for Brexit as well, which is why we got Brexit, which I'm imagining. Hands up, those of you who were supportive of leave. Yeah. So in terms of what is representative, I suppose this room isn't. Okay. Slightly unrelated question. What's the one thing you hate most in the world? Hate most in the world? 
I would say it's, uh, it must be liberals now. <laughs> Why? Because it, you sort of now have a word that doesn't really reflect anything about you and your sort. <laughs> that was targeted. Liberals are now, yeah, very. Nice. Liberals are now, it seems to me, fascists almost. Liberals have become the new fascists. How are you liberals want to, fascists? Because you want to close down speech. You even had uh, the president of this union coming out earlier today on the tab to say, I, I don't like anything Katie says. I dis disagree with what Katie says, which is utterly pathetic when you think about it. <laughs> From someone that, no, I, I saw you there. I, saw, I asked who the tramp was when you walked in. I think someone that is barely able to dress themselves is not someone I would ever respect. And I think for someone who holds an office, you should never speak as that office. You can speak as a person. I disagree with everything Katie says. Absolutely, I welcome that. I want you to have polar opposite views. I love the fact that students will stand strong behind what they believe, but never speak in the position of your office and disrespect the person that you invited to come and speak at your union that you have the privilege of being the president of. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna now actually open up questions to the floor, if that's okay Of with course, you. of course, and please do. Ask anything, Far say away. anything. Yes, over there. Yeah, me. Uh, hello. Um, you've mentioned that you're a, a very big fan of uh, Donald Trump, um, but you've also mentioned the um, necessity of uh, changing views and uh, adapting to the times and uh, you know, the importance of free debate. I wanted to ask, um, in light of that, is there anything um, which Donald Trump could do uh, as, a, as a foreseeable possibility in regards to foreign policy or domestic policy, which would mean that you would lose, um, uh, would uh, come to... Uh, Not support him so yes. much. Nearly got to the end of the question and everything. Well done, Cambridge. Um, <laughs> it's tough being a student when you're that clever, isn't it? I, uh, I'm always a Trump supporter. I don't think you ever become not a Trump supporter if you're someone like me that's followed him for so long. Certainly, there's elements of his foreign policy that I wholeheartedly disagree with. For example, I support President Assad. I think we need to be very clear. And it's a curious thing. It, it's sort of a perfect example of liberals at their worst, actually, uh, while you snigger. Did you support military action in Syria? I'm asking you with the stripy top. Me. No, you don't. Well, yours is sort of stripy. The lady two rows behind you. Did you support military action in Syria when Trump launched them? No? Yes or no? No. Okay, so the thing with the military action that just happened in Syria on the Syrian airbase where 59 Tomahawk missiles were launched, I disagree with that entirely. You know, we have to work out who the enemy is and you need to choose your monsters. And for me, we have to think about who's fighting ISIS. Assad is fighting ISIS. So the idea that we're going to drop Tomahawk missiles onto Assad's forces or his airbase seems craziness to me. And I was immediately backing off then for Trump. I don't support that foreign policy decision, but liberals seem to love it. All of a sudden, the liberals were saying, fantastic, he's taking action against Assad. And I always want to ask liberals then, so where do you think this budget comes from, this military budget? Well, you can't just magic up the military. You have to invest in the military. So, but anyway, so I don't follow his foreign policy decisions all the way through. I think he got rather surrounded by the kind of crazy military forces on Syria. Okay, any others? Sir. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, uh, Corey, uh, Trinity Hall. Um, you recently suffered with an illness that was potentially life-threatening, and I've known people in that position, and it, it sort of changed the way they viewed their life. Um, you're known for being bombastic and steely. Did it make you feel more vulnerable or perhaps more compassionate than you had been before? Um, so, did my illness make me more compassionate, or rather, fixing my illness? So, I've been yes. epileptic for 20-odd years, and I used to have three or four fits a night. I dislocated my arms 48 times so far in my life. Uh, they just came out of their sockets with my fits. But that's fine. And so, I had my surgery a year ago to mend that. I'm now missing this much of my head. 
uh, and had brain surgery that has fixed my epilepsy, so that's that bit. Um, but has it changed me? I suppose only in the sense of this peculiar kind of invincibility that I feel I have now, um, because I only had maybe a couple years, they said, one of these days a fit would get me and that would be that. And now I don't have that. And now I feel a bit like the Terminator that came back bigger and badder than before. So I think the surgeons kind of regret some of that stuff. But I certainly feel tougher. And it's, I think it's why I'm not afraid. So because I feel like I came, I had my uh, expected term, which was 41, and now I'm beyond that. So that's kind of a cool thing. Some people that hate their 40s, but it, for me it was like a, a goal. And now uh, I'm on extra time. And in extra time, you can pretty much do what the hell you want. So that's me. Yes, sir. Oh, I forget the mic, sorry. Yep. Did you have that surgery on the NHS or private? Uh, on the NHS. OK. <laughs> uh, hello, Joseph Burson, Downing. I'd Hi. just like to ask you what you would say to the people outside that accuse you of being a racist, of your views on refugees, and you say you'd like to have a conversation with them, what yeah. would you actually like to say to them? Of course, well, I would like, um, and it would be quite good if they were in here, you know, because then they could chat. I'd like them to say whatever it is they think they want to say to me. Like, if they want to say I'm racist, I want to ask why or how they think that. If they want to say that they disagree with my refugee policy, that I would turn back the boats, that I don't agree with migrants crossing the Med, that I don't agree with the NGOs that currently use boats across the Med more or less as a ferry service, and that's been proven now, um, that we're now sort of bringing migrants over from Lib Libya to Italy direct, 44,000 so far in 2017, the highest number yet. I'd like them to come in and discuss that with me. I fail to see the point in just silencing the conversation. And if I can later and they're still there, I would go and speak to them, absolutely. I am not frightened of debate, and I don't know why universities are no-platforming people. I don't see why that helps. Your person talked about free debate, not free speech. There is no such thing as free debate. There is only free speech. We can't start making, delineating small areas in which we operate. Speech is either free or it is not. Any more? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Shall I? I can get a mic if you like. I can do this. Um, I think it's very, it's all well and good you saying your ideas about refugees and everything. But um, I was just wondering, your statements before comparing them to cockroaches, mm. do you think that sort of inflammatory language is helpful? I mean, what do you think it adds to the debate? Yeah, I, I think in the co when it gets pulled out as an individual word, of course it's inflammatory, and you can see that. I think within the context of the article itself, which we don't need to necessarily go into, it was used in a kind of enduring way. Obviously, when I was sat down being interviewed under caution by the Major Crime and Homicide Command about the use of that word, because the head of the UNHR had said that I was the single big biggest cause of hate on the planet today, you know, that word becomes something quite different. People layer on different inter interpretations, such as the words used in the Rwandan genocide. But as I argued successfully uh, against them and the CPS later, I can't really be responsible for the layering on of different meaning by other people. But yes, it's an inflammatory word. And yes, to his point, you know, what's the most offensive thing? I think that probably still is up there with one of the most offensive <laughs> things. But what I can't understand, I suppose, and what I find offensive is two years since I wrote that column, 2015, we're still at the point where boats are crossing the Med. We still haven't done anything about it. No one has stopped the boats. How can that be? How, what, people cried a thousand tears over Alan Kurdi, the little boy that died on the beach, and nothing's changed. Is that not more pathetic? I think it is. Yelf, would you like a microphone? Hi, uh, Jonas Dean Robinson College. Um, thanks very much for coming to the Union. You spoke a lot about how you're very proud to put yourself on a platform of free speech. So I just wanted to take that away from ideology and apply, apply a kind of uh, practical litmus test. Um, you're the mother of three. Would you be proud of your children if they, as you have, turned around and said, uh, fat people are just lazy, that women couldn't handle special treatment if they got it, or that our president looks like a hobo? Uh, is that what you'd find really pleasing as a mother? What did you just call him? That's well. You called him what? That I'm, I'm, I'm obviously. No, what did you call him? 
Yeah, the, it, you it, just called him a, a, a hobo. A hobo. Is, is what you called you, your own president a hobo. <laughs> It, it's a, manipula a manipulation of quotes. I know, what, what is it? A, a, a manipulation, manipulation of quotes. Well, well done. Points like this are why you are considered... I win and you lose, that's correct. Uh, and next question. But, do, do, the problem is that you discuss free speech as such an important platform. Would I mind minute, if my children... No, I wouldn't mind that at all. You'd be proud of them to be as rude as you have to other people with no practical benefit to society. No practical benefit to society. About my fat, do you, have, you, have, you, have you engaged in my fat story? Did you watch me gain three and a half stone and lose it again? Did you? Uh, I, I, have, I have watched you do it. You have watched me? I've, 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 I've seen the documentary. The very clear shows you, one individual trying to put on weight and trying to replicate that for people that don't have the same metabolism as you. It's not from the same privileged background as you. Um, it's strange that you would take yourself to be the replication of everybody. So my metabolism is what? I um, don't share your metabolism. No, wh what is it? You made the assessment Individual about... Individual. Yeah, but what, what are you I'm saying about my metabolism? Is not symbolic of everybody's metabolism. Correct, but what did I do? Put on weight, what did I do? Lose it again. Right. To prove that, if I sat on my ass and eat too much, I get fat. It the really hasn't principle. answered the question, would you find it pleasing? I would children, find it, yeah, I would. Also if my children are just like me, well, I wouldn't want them just like me, but would I want them to stand strong behind an opinion? Yes. Would I want them to always back down? No. Would I want them to be like students today that always want to hide in the mob and say, I disagree with someone just so that they fit in and stand on the picket line? No, I would not. And would I want a bunch of people who think the world owes them a favour? No. And do I want my children to be villains or victims? I'd rather have a villain in my squad any day of the week. Do you yes. not, oh, sorry. Do you, you, not, sorry. do you not believe that what you say is on a platform of hate? When you say things like, prisoners that are suicidal should just go kill themselves, well, you believe that makes you a bastion of morality rather than a hateful human being. Did I say at any that point, is, have I, cla have I claimed, when did I ever say, I, Katie Hopkins, am a bastion of morality, apart from just then? <laughs> <laughs> what you, it's very clear that what you do, you claim to be... A yeah, are some prisoners that have done despicable acts, would I leave them alone in their prison cell with a rope? Absolutely, I would. Yes, ma'am. It's pretty hard not to dance. OK. Thank you, thank you very much for coming to speak to us at the Union this evening. I think we all really appreciate the opportunity to discuss these issues rather than have, have debate rather than necessarily just have speech. I think it's pretty clear that you don't approve of um, university culture and possibly particularly of this institution. No, 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 not of just of Cambridge. Not at all. Like Cambridge and Oxford are my two favourites. It's why I come. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but... How, you've, you've said that it's important to change things, not just talk about it. How would you change the way that young people view these issues in order to solve these issues rather than just being aggressive about it? Yeah, of course. And I don't think I am just aggressive about it at all. I get a lot now of emails from people. People can contact me directly, which I'm sure you, many of you will want to do after this evening, if only to ask for autographs and you know, photographs to pin up on your fridge. Would you not agree? Um, <laughs> But so I get a lot of um, kids now, actually, younger children that email me because their schools, they find, they have no space to have a view. So they have assemblies where they're asked to put their hands up if their parents vote UKIP or whatever. I'm not a UKIP supporter, but then they're made to feel kind of shamed by that. And this is four, five, six-year-olds. Uh, my daughter had to go to another trip to the mosque the other day. Uh, she asked, I, I helped her think of the question, obviously, why did she have to be separated from the boys as part of their trip? And um, the, the guy, the imam, said, oh, it's to do with, you know, modesty. And she was like, yes, but it's the same for all of us. And the imam said to her, no, you wouldn't understand because you're English. So I think there's just a sort of simmering tension for me in schools where very young children are being taught. And I understand why Trump is wrong, Trump is bad, because they see that Trump is, it's being taught in schools that Trump is hate. And I get it because, of course, anyone that's not liberal is seen as being hate because the opposite is hope. But it worries me that children are being made to think a certain way. I had a guy's father email me the other day because his son had to write an essay and the topic of the essay was, they just watched a clip of me on some show or other, uh, write an essay about the reasons you hate Katie Hopkins which I get, like it's perfect. And I did actually offer to write the essay for the son to see what marks we could get together. 
But the father was upset because he was saying, well, why not push posture it as, you know, write down your view of Katie or write down your view of what Katie said. Make it not about the person, make it not just about hate. But it has been shown that, of course, for GCSE, if you write why you hate me, you get a better mark than why than if you write why you might agree with my argument. I worry that we are indoctrinating and brainwashing our children. And I did go to Ofsted, the offices, to talk to them about it and to ask if I could do a class in state schools providing balance. Uh, that got a no. And also, uh, we sent someone from the papers to take pictures. They wouldn't have a picture with me because they said I was too far to the right. Not physically, but politically. <laughs> So I do worry about children, and I do spend a lot of time talking to kids in schools, in colleges where I'm allowed to go, to try to get people just to stand strong for what they think. You know, I've had mums ring in my radio show saying that their son was sort of forced out of his politics class because he supported Trump and no one would sit next to him. And then the teacher said, well, you shouldn't have such strong views. I find that really upsetting. That's an upsetting call to get. And I think I'm trying to help maybe keep a bit of space for people to still be allowed to have those opinions. I worry that the list of things we can't say is longer than the list of things we can. Who fancies running up there? Do you fancy going that way? And then can we get some mics going that way? Is that possible? So we're covering off. So if we get the next mic ready while these guys are going. Um, bit of organisation in this room. Come on, people. What, what are your views on Theresa May? Do you think she's doing a good job? I think Theresa May is growing into her power. So I think she's become quite different over the last few weeks. She's becoming more powerful. I love the idea that she had dinner with Juncker and essentially told Juncker to stick everything he wanted up his ass. And somehow the BBC have been playing the narrative out today that that's a bad thing, that we don't understand Brexit, that out of his bag he brought the fishing quota regulations for Europe. And Theresa was supposed to go, wow, Juncker, that's really big, you're so impressive. And instead she kind of went, no, we're not going to do that. I quite love that. I love what's going to happen at the next election. I love the fact that Diane Abbott absolutely crucified herself today on LBC, which was pushed around uh, on BBC, and then I pushed it to America. So she's now been shamed globally, and that was a genius moment. Uh, my column today on Men Online, which I'm sure you'll all read avidly later, is about how strong leaders, strong female leaders actually, and which is why this kind of feminist thing means more to me than just protesting like some victim. Uh, Strong female leaders in politics never bring out their husband or lesbian girlfriend or wife or partner to kind of use as a campaign tool. Think about Dave, just call me Dave. How many times did we see Sam Cam? Or even Nick Clegg, the most flaccid man on the planet. <laughs> Every time he brought out Miriam, I was like, whoa, there must be something going on there because Miriam is hot. But you never see it with female leaders, do you? Theresa May, never see the husband. Thatcher, never saw the husband. Merkel, Merkel is the Elsa of the Ice Queens. She is awesome. Like, she could stab her mum and dad to death in the night and still turn up to Brussels in a pantsuit at 6 o'clock in the morning and discuss fishing treaties, and you would never know. Awesome. So I can't remember the question. Oh, yes, Theresa May. She's part of the Ice Queens. I love her. I even love the ginger dwarf from the north for precise Nicola Sturgeon, for the same reason. <coughs> Brilliant, sir. Uh, so you, you have great skin. What? You have great skin. Oh, thank you. No. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you, you talked about uh, the problem of indoctrination in education. Um, I wonder, do you think that there are any uh, common norms that need to be taught in education for the purpose of, uh, for example, free speech itself. Uh, and how is it possible to separate these things from things that would uh, be in indoctrination of mm. young kids? Yeah, absolutely. And it seems to happen mostly in this sort of social classes. It used to be general studies in my day, bearing in mind I'm very old where you could kind of be taught subjects by a liberal teacher, and it was all a bit, 
What I'd love, you know, is to have children and bring in someone from the far left or the liberals or someone, anyone, and then bring in someone from the other side and let the children listen and then talk about where they were feeling, they were sitting, why they were attracted to this opinion or that opinion. I'd love that. That's what we need in our schools, I think. You know, what worries me is when we have children, we saw in the playground, I've got pictures of a lady, you know, it was a big thing when classes was to make protest banners with your kids. And the kids in the classes, they're years sort of six and seven, making protest banners. For me, that's already indoctrinating kids because you're already telling them that a protest banner is the way to express yourself in life. And the, the teacher that made these banners then had a go at me on Twitter. Unfortunately, then I chose to publicize what she'd done and that didn't go so well for her and her job. But she took the kids' banners out to a protest that night outside Whitehall. It just seems bonkers that that's what we're teaching children. Had other examples of kids in a playground being given Hillary Clinton mints to help persuade them that Hillary Clinton was the right president because she had a sweetie. It's just a bit craziness. And so that's why I'm always trying to get kids to say, look left, look right, stay looking right a little bit longer, and then make your decision. But most importantly of all, even if you're a raging vegan lefty lunatic who thinks climate change is fantastic and wants to dance on a protest line, Great, but then stand strong by what you believe. Don't get knocked down and don't let the mob, you know, that Twitter mob when they descend, you see people rowing back so quickly and it really worries me, the word sorry. You know, we have a few words in our language, don't we? We don't have many words. We don't have a word like the Japanese do for happy, sad. I always find that really amazing that we don't have a word for happy, sad. Um, their language is far more eloquent than ours. But anyway, we have some words that really matter. Racist, I think, is one of them. It's been used so often, it just is like toaster or cooker to me. Like, it means nothing. And same with sorry. Sorry has lost all meaning because people say sorry, like Sir Tim Hunt. They say sorry when they're ripped apart by the mob. And what they mean really is not I'm sorry. It means I'm sorry I'm being attacked. And I think that's a pity. I'm not sorry. I won't be sorry. I won't be saying sorry. And I'll be standing strong right here until I get arrested. And that will happen. Uh, was there, there was someone that was waiting longer. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, who's going to go after you? Can we get a mic to whoever's next? Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Oh, oh, I say. That was a lot lower than I expected. <laughs> I ju I'm just surprised. I, I, I was just surprised. Already in your talk, we've discussed a lot of issues ranging from migration to uh, gender equality to um, education and your policies on fat people. Um, what I would wonder is, do you not think that you would make more of an impact instead of having an opinion on lots of different stuff, rather than focusing on an issue that matters the most to you and, ca and putting your words mm. into actions on that specific mm. issue to have a bigger impact? Yeah, I, t I take your point. But then you become quite single issue, don't you? And uh, I find people like that, you know, it's incredibly boring, isn't it? Uh, Bob Geldof, I mean, get over yourself. Feed the world. You did that a long time ago, mate. Shut up. I just, I just, uh, I'm not a very single issue person, if we're, if we're honest. My mind is more, I feel busier than that. And, and I take your point, and I could channel my energies better. And people have often asked me, look, use your platform more wisely. And I, I hear that. I, I genuinely hear that. But my kind of feeling on that, and it is just a feeling, it's not strategic in any regard, as we would probably guess. My feeling is that my, my job, the thing that I feel like I'm doing, is giving voice to some people who think some of the things I say but maybe feel like they've no longer got a right to say that stuff or just don't want to take the crap or need to distance themselves from someone saying it, even though they might agree with some of what she says because they just don't want to be seen on the wrong side. And I feel like that's my job. And there is something easier about doing this job as a woman. I definitely get away with a whole bunch of stuff, love this song, uh, because I'm a woman. A whole bunch of stuff. It would be like... I can say stuff about feminists, about equality, because I'm a woman, that men couldn't say. The same as if I was black, I could say stuff that I can't say. You know, we get given that gift. I see myself as having the gift of being a random, not very female-looking woman. And I use that to say the stuff that we can no longer say. I sort of love it. And I really like this song. 
Right, who's next? Um, as was just mentioned, you have a view on almost everything and a solution to almost everything. Or well, you, you claim you do. Wouldn't you then be successful in politics, for example, if, as you said earlier, you represent the views of lots and lots and lots of people, maybe um, a lot of UKIP supporters, you know, they got four million votes or something in the last election. If you do represent so many people, why don't you, you know, put it into action, go into politics, and you know, do you think you'd be successful? No, I think it'd be horrific. I'd be dreadful. I, I don't think there's such a thing as UKIP anymore at all, actually. I think UKIP died a death a long time ago. I was never a supporter, but certainly they are a redundant party. They are not a party. Uh, I don't believe they exist, actually, anymore. I think they are probably a national tragedy, although, of course, they did achieve the very thing that 52% of the country who voted wanted them to achieve. Uh, would I be any good in politics? No, absolutely not. I'd be useless. I would never say anything I was supposed to say. I would never listen to the daft trout who's giving me a briefing on something. I would never stick to the three points I was supposed to say. And I would never play by the rules. And I couldn't be asked to kind of suck up to the right people to get ahead. So I would be disastrous. And I think one thing is for sure, in politics, I wouldn't have a voice as just me without a party. I have a radio show, the most listened radio show on a Sunday. I have the most read column on the most read online paper. And I now have a voice in America. So no, I don't think I need a political party to get more support. Oh, I can't say you because you haven't got a mic. Who has a mic in their hands? I do. Hi. Oh. Uh, would you agree that the um, left wing... <laughs> Wait, can I just check who has right. mics? Hijacking the word democratic and democracy and anything to the right is popularist and... A no, you're Majority good. Word. Yeah, no, say again. Say your question again. Sorry. Oh, would you agree that the media is increasingly, with the left wing, uh, seeing the word demo democracy and democratic as synonymous and anything right wing is populist and is a pejorative word? Mm. So has populism become popularism, sorry, become a kind of pejorative word? I think that's right. There was this sense, wasn't there, that it's sort of populist. It's that kind of, macro, as Macron would call them, you know, the little people. It, he said, as if I would care about the little people the other day after he'd been celebrating his win in round one. Um, and I think that is, uh, has become a pejorative term. Uh, but I don't mind it, actually. I think we can own the pejorative. So if it's sneered at by the liberal elites, then I'm very happy that that's my territory. And so, for example, if most of this room didn't vote leave, I'm pretty sure I'm doing the right thing. A bit like in London, if I've pissed off most of London, as someone said the other day, then I'm definitely sure I'm doing the right thing. So that's how I kind of assess myself on that. I think the Marine Le Pen, Macron, uh, election will be super interesting. He's just said that he will walk out of their debate on TV if she is in nasty to him in any way. I don't know who he's going to go running to, but perhaps that will be his wife slash mum slash wife slash mum. <laughs> but the establishment love him. He doesn't have any support. He doesn't have any uh, constituency members. He doesn't have anyone to represent him. He's just Macron. He's called Emmanuel Macron. He called his party en marche in his own honour. We're going to elect him. And you guys probably, who supports Macron here over Marine Le Pen? Everybody. Anybody support Marine? Vas-y, Marine. Ah, voilà. Merci mille fois. Uh, OK, you're all big. Oh, is there another? Brave. Are you, are you Marine supporting? Surely not, darling. Got it. Uh, you're a Marine. One second. Sorry, I'm right there. You're a Marine supporter. Do you mean it? And I'm interested as well, someone who, so in schools, children will say they can't say they support Trump or their parents support whatever because they'll be bullied. There's just a thing about the mob I'm interested in. Uh, sorry. Um, oh, it is working out. Um, yeah. Earlier on, you said that you don't regret anything that you've said, mm. and you seem pretty confident that you're quite often right. But how often would you say you've ever been convinced that any of your views are particularly wrong or misguided? And if, you, if the answer to that is no, do you not think that that kind of stubbornness not to move your own position is as problematic, if not more, than the liberals that you claim mm. to be kind of ruining the country mm. at the minute? Yeah, I think it's a really fair one about being stubborn and not moving your views or not being prepared to change. And that, that does happen when sometimes when I have... It's not... I never be kind of changed by 
a politician or someone in charge, I don't think. I think I automatically reject that. But certainly when callers ring in to radio, very often when it's mums or someone upset, uh, then I get it. Uh, I spoke to a father. I, I had a strong view on autistic kids. My own child's autistic, but I have a very strong view on some mums who I believe look for labels rather than ways to help their child navigate a strange world. But a father, and I was against the drugs they issue for that, a father called my radio show and said, if I don't give my son the drugs, my son is not allowed to go to school. They won't accept him. And things like that make you stop and go, well, where does that leave you? I think when people argue as a parent with me, I back off, especially on those sorts of things. But yes, otherwise I am probably <coughs> too stubborn. And I think that is, would be a fault. Yeah, you, so you've got one. Have you got a mic somewhere here as well? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. I just want to uh, pick up on something you said earlier. Uh, what can't you say because you're white? So as a white person, so um, <clears throat> what's the Netflix, so there's a Netflix series come out that is white people, dear white, dear white people. I, I think even, um, I tried it today with my new Snap Twat, which is why I post things and delete them immediately so that other people then post my shit. But um, I don't think I can put dear black people. I don't think you can just do that. And I certainly don't think I can, sorry? No, no, yeah, the tweet from this morning, but my point is, if you put that, I don't think you can put that. If you take that the next step, dear black people, to only black lives matter, etc., I don't think you can put that either, because you will be shouted down. So I think as a white person, there's things I can't say. Just as if I, was, if I wasn't a girl, a woman, whatever I'm supposed to be, I wouldn't be able to get away with some of the stuff I say about women. But men can't say what I say. No way. No way. On Fox, I see it all the time. Fox News at the moment, they're, they're being destroyed by stuff blokes have said about women, stuff that I would probably get away with. So I just see that as the imbalance, like it's an imbalance. You disagree? You say, say your thing. Um, just saying what you think. Um, this is your opportunity, so this is your chance to say. No, I have said, but what, what's your... That, so all the entirety of what you have been punished by the left for not being able to voice your opinions is uh, dear black people. That you're saying that's what's your oppression of speech. Three words. No, I'm saying that I can say things as a woman that I can't say if I was a man. I don't believe I can say some things as a white person. You just did. That you could say if you were a black where person. Is, where are all the pitchforks are saying dear black people? I can't see them, unfortunately. Maybe you can. Okay. But when I posted it on Twitter this morning, it caused a slight outrage. That's just how it works. But I, I take your point. You're saying what I'm saying is crap. I get it. Okay. Oh, is this on? Uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> You're good. So last week, Stephen Fry came to talk at you. I heard. And he talked about mental health. Yes. And you say that physical health is the fault of the person and the NHS should be privatised for that reason. Yes. What do you think about mental health? Is that the person's own fault as well? No, but I think we have to be very careful when it comes to mental health about what mental health issues are. I personally didn't enjoy a whole kind of thing of our princes speaking out about mental health. As I'm sure you're aware, I found it to be ugh, almost, it was too much in the press for me. Uh, I also think grief is quite a different thing to particular mental health issues. And I actually prefer my royals ice cold like Princess Anne, who looks like she could gut roadkill after she's killed it. So just for me, that's where I went on mental health issues. I also am concerned that we don't ask people to think about how they can. Sometimes I feel in life you have to decide that you'll be brave some days and let yourself catch up. I, I, I come from more of that school, which is like put on this face and let the rest of you catch up. Some days we all have to do that. I missed half my head for six months. Some days you have to, I had a sign saying no bone flap on my head. You know, some days you have to put yourself forward and then hope the rest of you catches up. But that's not everyone's view, and I, I appreciate Stephen Fry's the respected authority, but did I necessarily enjoy the endless heads together from the princes? No. And do I need to be softened up for the engagement of Meghan Markle? No, I'm okay. Thanks. Yes. Oh, I said yes, I didn't mean it because someone else has got a mic. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, hello. Hi again. Flammable um, sweater. So one of the first things that you talked about was kind of 
what you say is the kind of acting mistakenly from the pussy marches. Oh, yes. And the fact that they all had different aims and it was kind of all over the place. Frustrating, yeah. But then you talked about yourself as someone else who wants to try and make a difference and said that you don't especially value having a singularity of focus or any no, no, no. specific aim. Yeah. When you say things like that, which clearly contrast so deeply in the same sitting, how are we supposed to believe that you have any coherent mm. understanding of your own ideas? Or is it just that you want to provoke people? Is, is that the aim? Because if that is the aim, then why don't you just say that mm. when you're so free to say what you Of course. Think? And I think it's a really well put question, probably the best one. I think it's well put together. But I feel that uh, my... So if you're a feminist and you're on a pussy march and you want that to become a movement, you have to move people behind a single vision of what you're trying to achieve. I'm trying to say, look, I speak for some people who can no longer have a view. I'm not trying to achieve kind of change in the world. Do I want us to have Brexit? Yes. Do I want us to have Theresa May? Of course. But I don't want a single thing to take a movement forward. And that's what the feminists should be doing with their pussy march if they want to. It's not enough to have so a board saying my vagina's they, made of steel. What do you think they should be uniting behind? But also... God do you knows. I don't even know. I mean, for me, feminists don't understand the fact that we do have equality. They can't get their heads around the fact that we already have equality. Why aren't well, they marching outside see, of places where women see. are oppressed? Why aren't they on the, on the banks of the Med sort of questioning why women and children don't make it? Why aren't they outside the Saudi embassy marching about FGF? Why aren't they doing stuff about the women that are in trouble? Why is it always just marching around city centres wearing stupid hats? Maybe because... <laughs> maybe because London is a city which my has one a great member. deal of... of um, publication about what's well, going on This was Washington, it, but it happens in London yeah, as well, yeah. and Los Angeles, and California, and because any of the rich cities. people, yeah, be because honest. they're using places where rich people, people are definitely currently listened to, and it shouldn't be the case that they are. But why the don't places. they get up and go to places where they could make a change for women and children? Why do they just stay in the rich places, talking to each other, wearing silly hats? Because they want to be in the rich to city because like it's comfy yeah that's right i i, I take your point but i uh, women are such a disappointment to me what do you think that women should be uniting behind what do you think would be the best cause currently to bring more equality to a greater number of women across the world to to basically face facts to recognise if you want to take a year out of the workplace to have children, you will be paid less than a man who stayed there working. If you take a year out on maternity leave, you may not make it to the board level of a FTSE 100 company. That if you get employed off an all-female shortlist, perhaps you weren't good enough, you were just the best woman that was there. That if you're on a panel because you're a woman, maybe you weren't that funny. Maybe you're just there because you're a woman who's sort of a bit funny, who has to be told the very funny someone when they're introduced because they're not that funny. I never want to be part of a quota, and I would never take a job off an all-female shortlist. I either want to be the best person for the job, recruited on merit, paid on performance, rewarded on results, or I don't want to be in that position. Certainly not because I've got a vagina. Okay, next question. I can't embarrass you with that word at all, can I? Hello. I have a question as well. You've got a question? Sorry. I, sorry. Where are... Sorry. Hi. Oh, <laughs> I'll do I apologise. He totally distracted me asking if he could ask a question, which is lame, because he's also got a seat, so... Well, here's one for you. You say that you want to give a voice to real people, and I'm sure that on some issues you do. That's good. But I think the problem is that you use such divisive extreme language. You alienate people, and as a result, I don't think you do contribute constructively to the problems we have in society, because to do that, you need to be more inclusive, you need to build consensus, you need to rally for people around a cause. Ultimately, I think it's the problem solvers rather than the parasites who are remembered. So my question is, was it all worth it? Was the hatred worth it? And how do you justify it to yourself? Hmm. Yeah, I kind of felt like you should get that. I kind of felt like you should get a round of applause too, because I think you, that, that summarized the feeling of a lot of people. And I think it's well led to that. So I think fair play. Um, Good. Better than your question. Good clapping. Stick to clapping. You're good at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, I think I think your point is is pretty much well made. I think. Uh, do I want to be remembered for hate? No. 
And do I see that for loads of people that would be the case? I don't even want to, you know, I wouldn't be remembered anyway. We all know that the next day no one would give a shit. In fact, the same day no one would give a shit. Um, in fact, I did say the other day at my grandfather's funeral, I don't want a funeral at all, actually. I find them to be really strange things where people eat sausage rolls and look sad. But um, do I want to be remembered? No. But do I think the people that uh, matter, I really matter to me, think I'm kind of all right? Yeah, I, I do, actually. And uh, do the people that I work for think I turn up, work hard, do a good job, go home? Yes. So in many ways, the kind of basic levels of things that matter to me are good. And I am hugely encouraged, uh, whilst not seeking kind of validation or something, I am hugely encouraged when, I am, when people shout out of their car windows, not, not necessarily rude things, that doesn't happen, but when they shout out, go on, Katie, come on, Katie. You know, when you get a million people following what you say, there is validation in that. Maybe it's ego, too, maybe, but I'm happy with that. Boys. Why do you say such extreme things? I as don't, what, what's what, what, extreme? Here's an example. You once said that oh. Ebola was an effectively uh, a, a form of population control and, and you respected yes. it for being that. Yeah, it was quite... That's disgusting yeah. to most people, Katie. So why do you say those sorts of things if you genuinely want to be the voice of the real person? So Ebola as a population control, and for you that's disgusting. For me it was sort of a... I guess an assessment in terms of Ebola as a kind of form of control was pretty awesome. It was kind of a, a low-level observation. Ebola bomb, when I called the Scottish nurse, do you remember the Scottish nurse that came home that knew she had a temperature but didn't say anything because she thought she'd keep it on the down low? When I called her an Ebola bomb, that was when our, the police said that they were going to repatriate me from Australia. So I, I do see that that can be offensive. Do I think it was massively offensive? No. Do I think what's more offensive is the fact that we do nothing about it to the point that it, until the point where it looked like it might come to America? Mm -hmm. Or the point where it came to the UK and suddenly we had a Scottish nurse with it that no one was allowed to criticise. Do I think that's offensive? Yes. Does anybody do anything about Ebola until it nearly hits us? No. Is that what you should be focusing on? Yes. I'm so glad I brought you, darling. I'm so glad. Uh, would someone else like to ask? Them? I don't know if we should allow you. You get too much say already. Yes, darling. Oh, yeah. Hey, sorry. Um, I thought that was a good question, but I'm actually a little bit sceptical. Are you actually just a fairly persistent character actress and you just say all this mean yeah. shit because it gets you paid a lot? Yeah. I mean, it's just... It's just it's You're just a bit too naughty in the things you say. It's just, and it's kind of like, it's just, it's just, it's so vacuous and so boring that like, you've got to be like an Alan Partridge type figure just with like less, less fucking success. <laughs> it's just about... No, I mean, no, but I quite liked that as it went. <laughs> I did. I quite liked it. I think if you try to keep up a character for so long, I guess it's, what, is it 10, 12 years, you'd send yourself slightly mad. But I genuinely enjoy what I do. I think what's, what is a bit bonkers to me is that you can't envisage that there are other people that think the things I think. That you can't imagine there's someone else other than me. Do you not see what I'm saying? You think I'm an actress or being an idiot, whatever, vacuous. But I find it strange that you can't see. If I was just talking utter lunacy to everybody, you, you think I'm a lunatic, fine, is that I wouldn't have people listening. I wouldn't have an audience. No one would read what I did. No one would listen to the radio. No one would care. I would just be a mad woman standing naked at the rain. <laughs> if I was a what? A lizard. A lizard. I mean, it's possible. It's possible, but I suppose what, what we always try and do is see that, that the reason you have a voice is because other people think like you think some of the time. So, <laughs> uh, who would like to ask any other questions? Uh, yes, Esther. Um, you said that you would, that you're a feminist, but, yes. And you said that if we were feminists, we would be helping people who are um, on the med and their women. Why aren't you 
going over and how yeah I really events. tried I could I can print out my emails you can go on my Twitter today more with medicine front fr medicine sound frontiers asking please can I come on your boat please will you let me on your rescue ship please show me I'm wrong L endless endless bidding lobbying campaigning Italian Coast Guard Libyan Coast Guard I've been on it for months no one will let me on their ferry sorry rescue boats if you know someone that would let me on their rescue boats, I'm horribly seasick, it will be awful for me. They would love it because I'll suffer. I've tried, I've tried. They won't let me near them. Hi again, Katie. Um, I just is this your second question? It is my second Has question, Has anyone yeah. not asked a first question that they wanted to ask? Because this is just nonsense. Pass the mic along, please. <laughs> would you mind passing the mic along? It's not that I don't like you, darling. It's that I, I think have it's one. Fair. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I want to say, you said you want people to have a voice. Go for your life. And you want people to speak out loud You're and doing communicate it. themselves. Okay, we've got the big warm-up. Go for the big okay. line. I just, just wanted to check, because you seem a bit dim on that point. Um, you say how mental health shouldn't be talked about. And yet, among young men and people of our age group, it's more pressed than ever. And it's currently an issue that is really not being resolved, because people aren't speaking about it. How do you aim to resolve young people dying if... We don't talk about it. I, I don't aim to resolve young people dying, and I do appreciate suicide is the biggest killer of men under 50. But I can't, I'm not here to heal the world. Like, I'm not Miss World. I think that's quite clear from looking at my face. I do see that people need to speak about it. I like the idea that people now have avenues to speak about it. My concern with mental health is that almost very much like LGBT became everybody had to have something about their sexuality whether you were gender queer gender normal gender questioning until the point where people like sue perkins said look i was a lesbian when it was cool to be a lesbian and now it's just boring i feel like mental health we're in danger of not looking after the people who have genuine mental health issues because suddenly every celebrity you're not a celebrity unless you've come out and said that at some point you struggled with mental health like, I'm sick with vloggers and vloggers, young teenagers, who are supposed to be there kind of helping people find strength, just confessing all about the fact they were bullied at school. Like, to be a vlogger these days, what do you need? To know the Mac counter and have been bullied a bit. Like, I want people to step up. I think there's plenty of opportunity for people to talk about mental health. I've almost got to the point where if you're not well known and you don't have a mental health issue, you don't count. It's much more fashionable to have one. That's how I genuinely, honestly feel. So I'm not your person to solve it. Clearly, Stephen Fry absolutely would be. Yeah. Hello, uh, Louis. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. I have no idea where that noise is coming from. You might. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is going back a few questions. I thought that was my calling then. I thought this was it. I thought, shit, the guy that said, how are people going to remember you? This is my moment where I get taken off the earth. Hello, <laughs> you fucker. You're um, going to die alone in Cambridge. Of all the shitty places to die, you're going to die right <laughs> here. Okay, uh, going sorry, back sir. a few questions. Yeah, Dear yeah, yeah. black people, what the fuck were you going to write if you were going to write that article? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really. I, was I, just I mean, yeah. I'd like to hear what sort of venomous bile you'd write. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write that article. Please do. Yeah, okay, I'm <laughs> going to write that article. I think you're wise. And then do you I'm have gonna any work. little yeah. taster? No, but I'm just thinking I'm going to write it as I would think it, and then I'm going to see what my editor says. Very excited about yeah. seeing the end of your career. <laughs> um. <laughs> fair play, fair play. Uh, how are we doing on time and how... We, we can have uh, one more. One more what? Question. Hour? No question. The music stopped outside. It's disappointing. I know. Can we not rally the troops? So Sorry. one more question. You choose, because... Me. Oh, yes, good. Go. Power to the mic. You're right. Try speaking and see what happens. Um, Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> a few moments ago, you said that if you had to play a character for 10 or 12 years, you'd go completely insane. Mm. Earlier in your talk, you also said that some people with mental illness should just put a good face on mm. and, and hope that the rest mm. catch up. So you've essentially asked the exact same thing of people with mental illnesses that you said you couldn't bear to suffer. So my question is this, why is it fair, why is it completely unfair to assume that you would put on a facade for years and years when for some people with mental illnesses that's their entire life? Mm. 
I mean, I think it's not exactly a, a raising, <laughs> rallying question. If I'm speaking, you know, in a mercenary way, it's not the big finale I was hoping for, if I'm honest. But um, I just think you do have to sometimes just push yourself forward. And sometimes we do have to live a facade. And I don't buy into the victim status or, you know, that that's no way to live your life. I appreciate some people have problems. I appreciate people want to talk about them. These are not my areas that I'm that interested in, if I'm honest with you, because I believe we are in danger of teaching people that it's fashionable and cool to make sure you have a mental illness, just as it's fashionable and cool now to have 59 different forms of sexuality when we used to be binary about, what, 10 years ago. I'm fine that people want to have choices. I just don't need to be part of them. And I appreciate you and I are at opposite ends of this spectrum, yes? We could not be further apart, exactly. And that's why that's kind of where we're all going to stay. I'm not going to bring you to me, and I'm not going to come to you, but it's all right that we have massively different views and opinions. Opinions aren't right or wrong. Life is not an exam, and no one made you invigilator. So I'm okay that you're here and I'm here. In fact, you're probably more okay that you're there and I'm over here. I get that. I get that. Great. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for asking questions. That's exactly what we wanted. And I'm sure Katie would love you to email her with more. Oh, right, yeah. Mm. Uh, yes. But otherwise, thanks very much for coming. Um, other things for the week, we have Sigma tomorrow, the DJs, uh, which will be here from 7 o'clock. And then on Friday, we have Piers Morgan, who's your boss. See? He's my boss. At the mail. He's not my boss, you lunatic. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Friends. He's less well-read right. than I. Okay. My columns are more well-read than his. Do remind him of that when he's here. <laughs> There's a question for him already. Um, but yes, that's on Friday at 7 p.m. That'll be really great as well. And on Thursday, we've got our debate as well about um, immortality. So that'll be interesting too. But otherwise, thank you very much for coming. And if you wouldn't mind remaining seated until we've left, just so we can flow. <laughs> so I don't get stabbed. Yes. But otherwise, oh thank you very much. And if you can give a round of applause for Casey. Thank you, thank you.